Hello, Hive Nation. Welcome back to the Hive Nation podcast. Each week, we have leading experts in personal and professional development share their journeys and expertise to help you connect, engage, grow, and evolve. This episode of the Hive Nation podcast is sponsored by Lost River Distillery. Vodka crafted by hand, enjoyed by the best. Hive Nation, good morning and welcome uh, welcome back. Uh, we've had a bit of a hiatus, but here we are again, uh, full swing. Today we're with Josh Buchanan. He is the owner-operator of uh, Magnaltis Cons- Consulting. Uh, Josh does a lot of business uh, analysis and, and uh and business consulting around how to start up and how to continue on after startup and uh, just the questions that evolve from you know starting a business whether you're 25 days into it or 25 years into it it's one of those things that uh, that Josh can help you with so Josh uh, thanks for being on the podcast today thanks for having me um, so Josh is a uh, is a Métis entrepreneur and, and that's that's very uh, key to, to point out here as well um, you know, there, there is obviously a lot of factors that go into being an entrepreneur, but uh, the startup around being an entrepreneur and being a business entrepreneur is, is two different things. So, uh, Josh, why don't you tell us why and how you got into being a business consultant and what is your drive to continue on? Sure. I think for the why, I think it's just the right fit for me. It's such a natural fit. Like I get to combine all my work experience educational experience, life experience with my, my skills, my interests, I get to just take all those things and combine them into a job. So it hardly feels like I'm even working. So that's the main reason why I think is uh, just the right fit for me, even in terms of um, just being independent and wanting to do things my own way, being a business consultant for my own company just gives me that freedom too. So that's really, you know, why I'm a business consultant. And then for how that came about, I think it was just something that was long overdue for me, really. Um, I have a text message from my older brother saying I should be a business management consultant, and that was from 2014. So it's been a long time coming, I think, um, for me to do this. And it's kind of just being a business consultant is not something you plan for, right? You, you could go ask a bunch of grade 12s what they want to do, and I know they get that question a lot, but it's, you know, there's, there's kind of a clear path for a dentist or a teacher or an accountant or something like that no one's going to say they want to be a business consultant. It's just kind of one of those careers that you, you stumble into. And so I guess that's kind of what happened for me too. I was just always interested in business. I think I have a very um, business mind, very uh, practical mind. And so, yeah, I worked, um, you know, I went to U of S here and studied business economics, Uh, worked in property management for quite a while, which is kind of a good fit in that sense too, Mm -hmm. where I have that variety of, of business sides of business that I'm dealing with. And then, I was actually an instructor at a college in Regina for business as well. So that's kind of how it all happened. And then I mentioned too that I'd, I'd done a lot of traveling. And so what I would do is I would like work for someone here in Saskatoon or Regina or whatever for a year, year and a half, and then save up some money and kind of get bored of it and then go travel. So eventually I was like, I can't keep doing that. Like I need to build something bigger picture for myself. I like being in control. I like, you know, doing what I want, how I want, when I want. So it was, you know, really the time for me just to start my own thing and, and kind of create that lifestyle and that career for myself. So that's kind of how it all unfolded, I guess, to kind of make it a short story. Yeah, that, no, that's awesome. The, uh, the the thing that I wanted to touch on, and we talked about it in the green room, so you mentioned that you do, you know, you travel, and, uh, and you use the word nomad, and I, I like that. That's, that's, that's kind of funny. But at the same time, why don't you explain what you learned when you do travel like that and how you uh, do, you know, incorporate it into your day to day as to how you see it fit today? Sure. And it was very much like that. Like I wasn't doing one week all inclusive trips or things like that. I was going like sometimes six, eight months just living out of a carry on backpack in various different countries and just, you know, living with locals and villages and stuff. So very unique uh, life experience. Just 
the exposure to different people, different cultures, different situations that, you know, it built patience, it built understanding, it built, built connections for me. So it's been really um, valuable just kind of seeing the different ways that different cultures do things. You know, here in the West, we kind of have this idea that this is how we do it. This is how it should be done. If you don't do it this way, there's something wrong with you, but that's not the case. In my opinion, at least there's, you know, different ways to do things. And sometimes, you know, other cultures have it, um, be, like do it a better way in, in some ways, but I've learned a lot too. Um, it's been nice here because as you know, like Saskatoon is, you know, growing in terms of being more multicultural. And a lot of the people that I work with are immigrants from different countries. So not only does it help that I understand different perspectives, but it just allows me to get more comfortable with them to, to build a relationship when they know that, that I've been to the country that they're from, or I know a little bit about their culture. It just, yeah. it makes it so much easier to connect with them. And so that's been a huge uh, benefit as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because, you know, you obviously wouldn't have just gone to like, you know, like the United States and, uh, and Mexico, you would have been in, you know, probably some yeah, like Sri Lanka, villages in Sri Lanka and Indonesia, like <clears throat> staying with people in Indonesia for a month and I was using a, a cup to shower and, you know, like really cool experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, from what we're used to here, you know, yeah. being in a civilized society, if you want to call it that versus, you know, being out in the middle of nowhere kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Much, you know, lesser developed regions I was staying in, which was really interesting to see just what life is like there. I can see how that would teach somebody patience. That and even just like the, you know, the transportation of getting around different countries and flights being delayed and, you know, being on buses that are just jam packed full of people. Like I, I definitely developed more patience, I think, for yeah. situations like that. So, <laughs> which has been really important as an entrepreneur, honestly, like that's been my biggest challenge is like, you know, I'll, I'll make a connection with someone or I'll, uh, you know, come across a, a, a potential opportunity. I'm like, oh, this, this is going to go somewhere. This seems good. And then don't hear anything. And then three months later, six months later, nine months later, sometimes a year later, that turns into something, you know, so some people are just slow to respond or just not in the right space yet. So that patience actually has helped uh, in that regard too, I think. Does any of your, uh, if this is your, your Métis background or Métis culture, help you within your development, uh, you know, function? I would say, you know, it's been good for me to be able to connect with that demographic. I mentioned I used to teach at SI, it was SIIT in Regina actually, which is the indigenous college there. So just being involved, um, with that demographic has been great because it's another demographic to connect with, you know, um, spent a lot of time in the Philippines and Indonesia and Colombia and stuff. So connecting with, with people like that and obviously you used to um, Canadians as well, but, you know, getting more involved with the people and the culture from Métis and, and First Nations has been really valuable as well. Just another kind of perspective to add. So For sure. So do you see a difference between dealing with like different cultures uh, and just the way that they, that they view aspects of business? Yeah, for sure. I mean, one thing is I think generally people coming from <clears throat> tropical countries are just more kind of laid back, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's not so much a sense of urgency whereas people from northern countries there is because in northern countries if you're not prepared you die <laughs> whereas yeah. in the tropics it's like yeah, it's gonna rain in a few weeks we should probably get a roof and but fruits <laughs> food is growing all year whereas here it's like no there's not food growing all year so just culturally people that are from northern cultures are just more on time for things mm -hmm. or at, at least they used to be not so much anymore but um yeah like th that's i think that's been a, a big takeaway for me too it's just kind of seeing the different the different dynamics um you know some cultures are maybe more uh assertive and other ones are less assertive you know so that's something to be mindful of too when dealing with different people do you take uh we talk about like all the differences when we like look at the world's cultures and and in traveling but do you ever look at the parallels between like the community culture that Métis and Indigenous cultures have versus, you know, the other underdeveloped countries you went to, like in, in Indonesia and all these places, like is the sense of community something you draw from to build business and work with your clients? I think community is big and that's, I, I mean, here in like the cities and stuff, community is just dying, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I've spoken to, um, you know, immigrants who kind of just feel like there's much community here and, and that's true, but it was different 30 years ago. We used to have block parties and stuff like that. Right. And that's one thing that's bigger in indigenous community, right? Is community is more important, just like in a lot of the other countries that I went to. Community is is more important, and 
I think that is hugely important um, in my field of work and for business owners as well, just because as as business owners, we generally become pretty independent and, and isolated, right? Mm-hmm. If you work, if you're an employee and you work in an office, you're connecting with people regularly. <clears throat> Whereas for someone like myself, it, it's just me. So if I worked from mm-hmm. home, I would almost never see anyone other than clients. So um, for, for business owners, whether they're Métis, First Nations or, or whatever, like developing community is super important, not only to not isolate yourself, but to have a referral network where you can send out your clients who are needing extra help and, and likewise other business owners can send people back into you. So, um, you know, that's been a big thing too. Yeah. So the big takeaway is make block parties great again. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was, it was different. I grew up in the nineties and like, you know, there was, there was block parties, always kids playing like street hockey and home run derbies and trampoline and stuff. Mm-hmm. And you just don't see that anymore. And it's, but, but you know, in countries like the Philippines, like they're just, just way more connected like that still video games and stuff here have kind of you know impacted yeah. that you know with and I agree with you like you know going to when you go to places like even Mexico and Dominican there's kids playing baseball till it gets dark like mm-hmm. you know they're just out there from the minute that it's light up to the minute that it's dark and they're not using the best equipment yep. but it doesn't matter yeah. right it just yeah. being out there and just enjoying the sport and just you know being active and that's how it was here 30 years ago too. that's, <clears throat> that's right kind of just slowly um, deteriorated no, you're right, hundred um, percent. The one question I was going to ask you, getting back to like the uh, the you know, the business side of it, as to what you how, how you help. What's the biggest need that you see in today's uh, small to medium sized businesses that uh, they need to succeed in today's you know demographics? It's a good question. I think my biggest takeaway um, from being in this position is just people just don't know what they don't know, and I don't mean that as an insult. I'm not calling them dumb. It's like they were never taught. There's no education on this. Like I went to the U of S for business economics. They never taught me how to start a business. Like, so people feel like, Oh, they don't have a business degree. Therefore they're at a disadvantage in some ways. Yes. But it's like those of us who study business, like we still didn't learn a lot of those steps. Um, so that would be the biggest thing is there just needs to be more education around starting a business, maintaining a business, having a successful business, even just the steps to start one. You know, I think, there's a big push right now for economic development for starting businesses, but it's targeting older generations, which is fine. I think they really need to focus more on, you know, getting in front of 16, 17, 18 year olds and say, Hey, I know we pressure you to choose a career, but have you thought about becoming an entrepreneur? Okay. You want to be an electrician. Okay. You want to be a dentist. Do you want to work for someone or would you rather start your own business? That seed needs to be planted at a younger age and not only plant the seed, but show what the steps are, show what the resources are, because I think, so many people want to start their own business and they just don't know where to start or they, even though they don't know where to start, they'll figure it out, but they don't have the right support and guidance and then they run into issues and then that business fails or maybe it does succeed, but at the detriment of, of many things, you know, friendships ruined or uh, financial problems or whatever, just because they don't have the support and guide, guidance that they should have. It's a really good point. We talked about it the other day too in our conversation about having a mentor early. And, you know, having the ability to have a mentor early. And I think that, you know, having a mentor and or network at 16, 17, 18, as you just mentioned, would springboard, you know, some of those ideas and springboard some of those opportunities that you have to, you know, start a business and to grow a business. But, you know, it's it, to me, that's not pushed enough to like the, the mentorship part of it isn't pushed enough. And you should find a mentor, whether it be, you know, a family friend or, you know, somebody who, who you can, you know, confide in. I think that, you know, at that early age would be a key time to, to start that mentorship and that network starting, even though you think, oh, 16, what do I need a network for? Right. Um, it's not for tomorrow, right. It's for five years down the road or 10 years down the road. Right. It's one of those things that, you know, everybody can, can benefit from a mentor and a network. Yeah, exactly. Even for me, I'm just finding like relationships I had 10 years ago are now, you know, coming back to life just because of the position I'm in kind of thing. Yeah. And not just mentors, but making those young people aware of the resources available to them because there are a lot of like economic development organizations that are, uh, you know, here to help those people start businesses, but they don't know about them. You know, there's, there's even a a Métis organization that helps Métis businesses 
Métis entrepreneurs starting out and I didn't know about them until about two years ago. And it's like, if I'm from Saskatoon and I study business economics and I'm Métis and I didn't know about you and I'm, I'm someone who's very kind of aware of my resources, if I didn't know about you, then, then no one knows about you. So right. there needs to be more um, exposure to those resources for um, young people and entrepreneurs. Yeah, I'm the same way until recently. I had no idea that the Clarence Campbell Development mm-hmm. Fund existed or Sask, Sask Métis. <clears throat> Yeah, development, uh, economic development corporate. I had no idea that those places did anything like that. And it's very much should be, like you said, it should be marketed or should be pushed out front where, you know, people can you reach out at least to those yeah. places and say, okay, where do I go? Like, uh, is there a Josh out there that I can talk to? Yeah, like that needs to be in the minds of, of all entrepreneurs and young people. And what I think would be cool is to have kind of like a, a grade 12 entrepreneur day you know we have like take your kid to work day why not for grade 12s like once a year set up at like prairie land park here in saskatoon and just have entrepreneurship day where just have a bunch of booths set up where it's different economic development organizations maybe different business owners that kind of want to share their story you know even banks that can talk about lending you know people like myself maybe talking about like what those startup steps look like to really you know make that create that awareness for young people as to what it could look like and where to start and you know who to reach out to because I think a lot of people too when they're starting they just um, they reach out to the wrong person to start out with like they might go to you know they're wanting to start a restaurant so they go to a commercial real estate agent to see what type of properties there are it's like that's a necessary step but that's not step number one that's (laughs) step number 12 right? right yeah so stuff like that too yeah you know we talked about it through the High Professional Network about starting an initiative like that, about having yeah. like an entrepreneur day or like having an, uh, but I, we, we always thought about like, you know, Biz, Biz, uh, Edwards Business School or like the U of S, but maybe, uh, you know, we should start earlier, like in the high schools with 16, 17, 18 year olds. Absolutely. Well, you know, think back to when you're 17, 18, everyone's like, hey, you're almost done high school. What are you going to do every single day for the next 40 years of your life? There's all that pressure, right? And yeah. we, we all know these like, this kind of library or whatever you want to call it of like 30, 40 careers. Like, do you want to be a police officer, a firefighter, an accountant, a teacher, a dentist? Like, but no one really talks about entrepreneurship. No, and no. I found even in, um, at Edwards School of Business, so I was, I was a econ major and I just took lots of classes, but even in Edwards School of Business, they don't really promote entrepreneurship. At least mm-hmm. that was my experience. It was, they were really kind of like pushing people towards thinking they need to be high up in a big company. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's one path and that's not the right path for everyone. Let's talk about the other paths as well. So exactly in the business school, it, you know, it, it's really, um, what I found too, is it's not business graduates typically that start businesses, business graduates work for businesses. Um, it's people who never went to university. It's people who dropped out. It's people who were engineers. Um, yeah, there really is not a lot of, uh, entrepreneurship being promoted there, or at least there wasn't when I went, I think it's changing a little bit now, but, uh, and you would not say breath though too, Josh, there's people that have uh, a degree in X that have, that don't use yeah. it. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? Like it's, 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 it's not necessarily because you have a degree in business means that you need to be a CEO of, you know, big company. Yeah. You could be a, a medium business owner, a small to medium sized yeah. business owner and uh, make an impact that way Yeah, by, you know, employing 50 people, right? And really it doesn't matter because I think for starting a business, you should be A, highly motivated and be an expert in your field. C, and not in that order necessarily, C is like understanding the business stuff. But if you don't understand the business stuff, that's where you get support. That's where you mm-hmm. get someone like me who comes mm-hmm. in to make sure that someone who's motivated and they're ex- and is an expert in their field gets the business stuff mm-hmm. right. You know, it's hard for anyone to be all three of those things. You know, so and I think that's part of the problem with you. You know, with young people uh, with the thoughts of starting a business, they think that there's an order that has to be followed. It doesn't necessarily work like that necessarily, but there obviously has to be a laundry list of stuff that needs yeah. to get done. Yeah. Not necessarily in the in a, in a one two three four order. Absolutely. And that's what I see is kind of going back to just people not, not knowing what they don't know. It's like, well, you know, you have to register your business you know, you have a business name, you actually have to register that with a corporate registry and then, you know, insurance and workers compensation and PST and GST and, and all those different things that they need to be aware of. Um, there's just not enough knowledge and there's not enough like teaching around that. It's interesting when it comes to like PST and GST, where I think the government's uh, provincial and federal kind of just think like, 
that everyone understands how that works, how those taxes work. It's like, oh, you start a business, now you have to collect taxes. You know what you're doing. It's like, no, no one knows what they're doing. That's no. What they want. That's right. In, in some ways, yes, but at the same time, like they have those taxes because they want to collect taxes. So if they're not educating people on, on how and when to like charge taxes to their clients, then they're not going to get those ones. So it's a weird dynamic. To yeah. Like, yeah. Our tax system is way too complicated and there's no instruction. So, and that's, they, that's, that's the, that's the only thing about being an entrepreneur that there is no instruction booklet for right. being an entrepreneur and there is no, this is what you need to do. And you know, that's why you have guys like yourself who say, you know, tell dummies like me, did you register for your GST? What's that? Well, there, there's really so much to learn as an entrepreneur. Like it's one thing if you are an expert electrician, but mm-hmm. if you start your own business electrician, there's there's so much mm-hmm. that you need to learn. And really, I think people maybe don't think about the, it this way, but when government's putting money into economic development um, companies that are you know funding different startups and stuff, in my opinion, they're not just doing that to be nice. They're doing that because they're trying to create businesses that, gen- that then create more uh, tax revenue for them. So they're kind of acting as venture capitalists in a way. It's just that their return on investment comes from from taxes rather than from royalties or something like that. So if if that's their goal, then things could be done a lot more efficiently and, and proper tax procedures should be taught. Agreed. So how can we, I'm going to say we as coaches and you know more specifically an individual like yourself that focuses on that startup, how can we better communicate with the young entrepreneurs or just you know a 50 year old who started a business, doesn't matter the age, to navigate that pathway because we understand that there's a lot of steps, but uh, an individual in the university route, they're so linear on, yeah, this is what you need to do, degree, and you know, let's be honest, universities push the a- academic route. Even my friend who's doing his PhD in physics, he's not doing it for the academia, he's doing it for what that PhD in particle physics is going to get him with jobs. But in high school, you're taught well physics yeah you need like at least two degrees to make that work is so uh to kind of go back to my original question you know how can we help identify the pathway to people that it's not just a line it's it looks like this and you're going to go up valleys and mountains to get to where you know the entrepreneurship journey leads i think that's where it's good to have that education like i actually do this one hour um, business startup seminar and webinar that i do for different organizations in the city and it's just it goes through all those steps but then on top of that, you know, you, if you have that type of entrepreneurship work day or, or um, workshop day, um, have some experienced entrepreneurs just sharing their story, how they, you know, they had some struggles starting out. They didn't have the confidence. They didn't have the knowledge and, and they had a couple of bad years to start out and they made some big mistakes and just kind of like share that, you know, like no one knows what they're doing completely to start out with. And if that's where community is important too, you kind of learn from your elders, right? so that you can learn from other people's mistakes. So it's both, it's like those really objective steps, like yeah. registering your business and getting a business bank account. And like, those aren't opinions, but then there's just things like, you know, careful with how you uh, get into business relationships with friends. And I made this mistake and my friend made that mistake. And just kind of like sharing that, those experiences, I think, um, you know, those two approaches would benefit entrepreneurs, I think for sure. And hearing that from experience versus learning it would help you navigate some of those bumps down the road yeah exactly and that's that's been a big thing for me just kind of as someone who's quite observant is just looking what other people are doing what's working what's not what mistakes were made you know just i think that can help a lot because i see a lot of people that run into you know big mistakes with their businesses that were probably easily avoidable if they had the right you know supports in objective terms but then you know uh, mentors giving advice or sharing stories for sure okay well it goes back to the old Old saying, right? You know, a good coach or mentor in this case isn't going to always tell you what you want to hear, but they're always going to tell you what you need to hear. Like, that's that's like my, my one cautionary tale I'll, I'll tell the high nation. It's like, if the coach or mentor you're in the room with is only ever going, yeah, good work, good job, good job, good job. Chances are they may be underqualified or they're really not there for your best interest, right? It's like, my favorite coaches were the, are the ones that are like, Okay, so here's where we went wrong. Um, I don't know if we can even fix this, but <laughs> yeah. but you know now we know what to do to avoid that in the future. And if we make that mistake again, well, then we need to really look and reevaluate on you know why did we you know get to this brick wall twice and and then move forward from it. But then you know that's the experience you need to have because 
uh, like you said, the, the snapshot of good, that's what everybody sees on social media. They see the big shiny signs, the sweet logos, the branding, the great videos, but they don't see the, ooh, forgot the PST GST. Now I got to <laughs> deal with that with my accountant. They yeah. don't see the, oh, we needed contracts for that. I didn't know that, yeah. right? They don't see the the back yeah. end business end of, of it. it. It's a good point too, what you brought up about like getting feedback from the right people. Like if I want feedback from people, I don't go to the ones that are just like, oh, that looks good. Like the cheerleaders that are always just going to say something nice. Yeah. I, I go to the critical people. Like tell me why this sucks. Like tell me what I did wrong. Tell me how I can improve this. Like if, if you really care about being successful, that's who you go to. Yeah. You know, there, there's people in my life that'll say like, no matter what, they'll support me. Yeah. And, you know, once in a while I'll bring things to their attention too, but when I really want feedback, go to the, the critical people. Yeah. yeah so yeah. when people come to me, I tell them like, I'm, I'm critical. Like, I'm not going to just be like, good job. I'm going to tear this apart. So if that's what you want, I'll do it. <laughs> Greg and I talk about it all the time. We are tired of hearing that's such a great idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. If it sincerely is a great idea, fine but but don't say that just to like be nice just to pump my tires i don't need my tires pumped i can pump my tires any day of the week yeah well i mean some people really need that maybe that type sure. of support but um other people like yeah you know if it's all a bunch of like yes men or, or people that are going to support you regardless like you need that that honest feedback from analytical people you do and it, it does not everybody's going to tell you the flat out that that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard yeah. and it doesn't need necessarily need to be worded like that but just for them to say you know, it's probably not the best idea. Yeah. Maybe you should rethink that a little bit. And then, but they have to tell you why as well, right? There are the people that always be critical no matter what. Yeah. But I also need to know why, and you know what the difference is, how to, how to yeah. change it. Yeah, constructive criticism. Because some people are always just going to give you a positive review, and some people are always just kind of negative. Like, go to the ones that are just objective, analytical, and they're just going to tell you how they see it and explain why and give you. Some, exactly. you know, some pointers on how you could improve it or whatever. Those, those are the people you should go to. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So from the, the coaching side of that, how, if at all, do you navigate a client that just puts on their earmuffs when you give them that constructive criticism where you're like, where they presented something, they're really proud of it. And a lot of entrepreneurs are, or you know, people that are trying to be that. Because it's their baby, they put everything, oh, the branding looks good, the website looks good, everything's awesome, and then you go, yeah, you missed the mark completely. That's a great question. But they go, I'm not listening. (laughs) I think the nice thing is people generally only come to me because they want uh, improvement, they want criticism. They go to their parents, they go to their friends if they kind of just want some some feedback. But Mm -hmm. like, if they're willing to work with me, if they're they're paying to work with me, then they know that I'm not just going to be that cheerleader. Yeah. You know, I, I do have clients where I'll come up with suggestions and, and they might think that's a good idea, but they just don't implement it. That would be one of the challenges I, I deal with. But, uh, you know, you, typically people are coming to me for, for guidance, for input, for coaching, consulting. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't see that as much, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, the, 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 it's the old adage, though, if you pay for it, you expect to get something out of it, yeah. right? If it's free, you, you kind of uh, take it as it is, or take it or leave it. Yeah, because I, I, like I'm giving solicited advice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and that's the difference between Different dynamic. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and so, that's you know anytime anybody gives something out for free, you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt. When somebody's paying for it, and when you're 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 giving you know experienced background, you probably should you know at least take heed. I am tempted to to give unsolicited advice. You know, sometimes I'm on someone's website and I'd be like, oh, you should change this and misspelling there and why do you have it like this? Like, I'm just picky about those things, but um, I refrain usually. So <laughs> that's, that, that's a great point though, because, uh, you know, I think any, any coach or any person that has that, you know, innate ability and, and drive to want to help people, right? It's hard not to give that advice. Mm-hmm. We see it all the time. I'll use judo as the example. It's, you know, one coach is coaching and then you, you can kind of see one coach, you know, really wanting to add that moment, but it's like they'll hold back because then, you know, the audience, which is typically younger kids are now getting like three different views on one specific technique. And they're like, well, who do I listen to? So it's always that like time and place, right? You know, how do I as a coach or a mentor or, you know, just, just a person giving my friend help really lend the proper advice when I need it and not 
you know, when they're at a peak of emotions or they just got, you know, let's go worst case scenario, they just got indicted for tax fraud. Uh, they're probably so focused on everything else that they need to deal with that, you know, the advice about their website, they do not <laughs> care about, mm-hmm. right? They're just going to go, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever, that's blah, blah, blah. Right, it's it's the time and place to that advice. Wow, Greg, just going straight to tax fraud, eh? Mm-hmm. Well, it was that's just tax season. <laughs> File your taxes, everybody, <laughs> or don't. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's some great advice. Uh, why don't you tell Hot Nation where, like, let's repeat your business again for for everybody listening. So. Sure. Yeah. So it's, it's business management consulting. It's called McNaltis Consulting. Really what I do is I help people start, build, grow, and improve their businesses. That's kind of my tagline. So really I work with, you know, people in any, and in any industry at any phase of business. I, I kind of like it all. Um, just very much being a generalist, I, I feel like I can, you know, offer some help in, in all areas. Um, yeah. In terms of like where to find me, I guess, um, I'm on Instagram. I don't post too much there. Uh, my website is just magnaltis.com. And then I've been posting a lot on YouTube lately. I've got um, 90 videos right now. And is it Magnaltis? Yeah, it's Magnaltis Consulting on YouTube. Just 90 videos on business management and business startup. Awesome. So just a bunch of like kind of short four to five minute videos on different common questions and topics and stuff like that. That's so, awesome. And I see that we talked about it earlier too, like on your website that you have courses on there as well that, that people can uh, can purchase. Yeah, exactly. So on top of those, um, you know, those free YouTube videos, I have a how to start a business in Saskatchewan course. And that's like seven hours worth of content, 70 different videos and quizzes and stuff like that. And that's on my website as well. And then as I mentioned, sometimes I do those uh, webinars and seminars too in the city. For anybody who's listening, who's not in Saskatchewan, yeah, can you help? Yeah, definitely. And actually a lot of those videos I have on YouTube, probably, you know, like 85 out of 90 are not Saskatchewan specific, uh, specific. you know, some maybe just Canada specific, but you know, they can really help people in, uh, mm. in any country. There's a lot of just general business stuff. So, um, yeah, no, I work with clients outside of Saskatchewan too. Just kind of depends what it is. Like I just actually wrote a business plan for someone there in Saskatchewan, but it would be not much different writing for someone in, in Manitoba or Ontario or, or Nova Scotia or whatever, you know, it's, things are pretty similar. It's just, you know, in, in different provinces, maybe there's different, um, provincial taxes and then different corporate registry kind of thing. But a lot of like the lenders to like, you know, the big banks and, and BDC and places like that are are Canada wide. And then a lot of things related to business are universal. So excellent. Well, Josh, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time to speak to live nation today. And, and there's a lot of great points taken out of this. So, you know, uh, get in touch with Josh through his website, uh, through us, wherever you want, yeah. but there's some great points taken out of that. And I think, uh, you know, it's probably worth a follow up, you know, eventually as well with some with some additional points to this conversation, Josh. But thanks for thanks for being on the Hive Nation. Thanks for having me. You bet. Appreciate it. Awesome. Hive Nation, don't forget, like, subscribe, and share this show. Follow Josh on all of his uh, social medias, check out his website. Uh, but for now, 